stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship found printed in your bulletin. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. God's mercy and grace flood this room and fill our hearts. Surely the presence of the Lord is in every place. God's love and power sustain the earth and fill the skies. Affirmation of faith found printed in your bulletin, the Apostles' Creed. Let us join together now. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. See, before you find your seats this morning, I encourage you to turn to the folks around you and to share the peace of Christ. Good morning, church. Welcome again to Dunwoody. My name is Josh Amerson. I'm one of the associate pastors here. Very glad to have all of you with us this Sunday morning in worship together. I want to encourage you, if you have not done so already, to take the Maroon Fellowship pads and to pass those down the aisle, fill out your information. And if you will send it back from whence it came, you can see who you're worshiping with. And if there's some folks around you this morning, especially folks on your aisle who you uh, do not know yet, I hope you'll take a chance to reach out and, and greet one another when the service ends later on. And if you are here for the first time this morning, a special welcome to you. We are so glad that you chose to be with us this morning. Uh, We've got some folks at the hospitality table, which is just out these doors and down the right towards the elevators, who would love to meet you after the service to share some information about the life of this church, answer any questions you might have, and send you away with a gift uh, from us. So please do that if you are here uh, for the first time this morning. A couple uh, announcements just about things going on in the church. We are... um, working towards a new pictorial directory. This is where there's supposed to be cheers of joy and jubilation. Yes, yes, groans and grimaces. We have online sign-ups. There are sign-ups out here in the lobby. I know some of you look ready to take your picture today. Some of you will benefit from the chance to sign up for something in a couple weeks and get yourself prepared for that. So. Please be a part of that, though. The, the, the picture directories are a great way for us to recognize each other's faces, learn each other's names, and know how to get in touch with each other and, and be a part of ministry together. So please be a part of that project as we do that the next couple months. And then a couple things just about worship today. Uh, earlier this morning, we had our bluegrass worship service and the contemporary service, which was phenomenal music. And um, in the service today, we are blessed to hear an original piece from our own Sonny Walden that he wrote within the last month to go along with today's scripture. And so it is, uh, I for one am just so grateful that we have uh, the, the talents and skills around us, especially in the music department, to lead us in worship. And so you'll want to recognize Sonny uh, after the service is over and thank him for sharing that with us. And we continue in our sermon series in search of God today that's looking at Psalm 139 and Luke 15. Uh, we're talking about Uh, today the way that God is everywhere. God is omnipresent. God is always and everywhere around us. We've been learning about God uh, being omniscient and knowing us, knowing us deeper than we know ourselves, about us being fearfully and wonderfully made and being loved by the Creator. And so we continue to search for and to seek out that God in our worship this morning. And as we do, I want to invite the children to now come down and to join Reverend Kathy for the children's moment. I'm switching sides on you today. Come on. How's everybody doing? Good? Good. You know my side. Hey, guys. How's everyone? Are we good? Yeah? So raise your hand if you've ever played hide and seek. Adults in the audience, raise your hand if you've ever played hide and seek. Okay, thank you. So pretty much everyone has, right? I want to tell you about this time that I played hide and seek at my mother's house with my kids and with their cousins. And so I was not it. I had to hide. And I found the best hiding place ever. It was in a closet behind some clothes and a vacuum cleaner. 
Yeah, it was great. And you know what? Whoever was it, I think it was my nephew, never found me. And he never found me, and he never found me. <laughs> and pretty soon, I've been sitting there or standing there very still for a very long time, and no one came to find me. So I decided I might better come out and go find out what happened. So I go downstairs, and you know what they're all doing? They're all watching TV. They left me in the closet behind the clothes behind the vacuum cleaner. They just gave up. Well, my goodness. Do you think that if God is looking for us, that God ever gives up? No. God never, ever gives up. And do you think there's any place we can go to hide from God? No, not even in a closet behind some clothes and a vacuum cleaner? No, or up under our beds? No, there is no place we can go. And you know what the great thing is? Is that even if God were not to be able to find us right off, do you think he gives up and goes and watches TV? No, that's the best part about it that God continues to look for us and God follows us around and makes sure that we know that God is always with us. Isn't that great news to know that no matter where we go, whether it's to school or to church or to the swimming pool or to the playground, that God is always with us and God can never, ever lose us. That's pretty wild, isn't it? Yeah. All right, so always remember that. Can we pray together? Let's bow our heads. Dear God, we thank you for always being with us, for never leaving us anywhere alone, and, f- and for those times when maybe we walk away or we decide to do something different than you would want us to do, that you follow us and that you're with us always. And we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, if you're going to Traditions and Foundations, Marianella is right over there. Otherwise, you can go back to your parents. As we come to this time of prayer in the life of our congregation, we look at the concerns and celebrations that you'll find on page 6 of your worship bulletin this day. The prayer concerns uh, are as listed, and we add to the name of that list, um, David Gilly. And we also want to share our Christian love and sympathy with Norm McKee on the death of his wife, Ethel, whose service was yesterday here in our chapel. The Cassie and Ken Odom on the death of her mother, Mary Ann Serta. Uh, grandmother of Ella and Trey. And we also want to celebrate the, the rosebud that is upon our altar this day, celebrating the birth of William James Karimplis, uh son of Emily and Matt. And the grandparents are Lisa and Bill Worthington, and we celebrate with them this new life into this family and this congregation. We have a time now of silent prayer where you can go and spend some time with God in a quiet way, sharing with God the concerns of your heart, followed by our pastoral prayer and then our Lord's prayer as we join together. So let us now spend a time of prayer with God. Oh God, we know you to be a God of all blessings. We know you are the source of all life and the giver of all grace. On this Sabbath day, when we gather in this sacred place and we pause to give thanks, we give thanks for the summer kaleidoscope of colors we have experienced, for the restful vacation memories that we have, for the continued anticipation of new beginnings as we begin a new school year and a new season of fall. 
And of most of all, for your grace that helps us become more than we could ever dream or imagine that we could be. Oh God, we are here because we want to walk with you. Yet we recognize how easy it is for us to wander away. Send us the gracious showers of your forgiveness to ease us through the drought of spiritual dryness that has weakened our souls. Help us to become more like you and less like our own insufficient selves. We come willing and open that you might lead us back to your heart. It is our hope that you might give purpose to our day, serenity to our hearts, and the grace that you have to help us to be your hands in this world. Oh Lord, you have always welcomed to, to us the one who knew what they needed and wanted inviting them to come close to you and find your touch upon them. In these quiet moments, we remember the names of those whom we need to also reach out to. We voice our deepest prayer that you will meet each one of us by our names and by the needs that we have. We cannot live in our world without seeing needs. Open our eyes to the people that want us to serve family members who need our attention, strangers to whom we offer kindness, needs that we have to the resources to meet in the lives of others. Wherever we go, let us be your hands. Let us be your feet and let us be your laughter and your joy and your warmth in this world. In the name of Jesus, the one who taught us all to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
please remain standing for today's reading from Scripture. The lesson comes from Psalms 139, verses 7 through 12, and is printed in the bulletin insert. Hear now the word of the Lord. Where could I go to get away from your spirit? Where could I go to escape your presence? If I went up to heaven, you would be there. If I went down to the grave, you would be there too. If I could fly on the wings of dawn, stopping only to rest on the far side of the ocean, even there your hand would guide me. Even there your strong hand would hold me tight. If I said the darkness will def definitely hide me, the light will become night around me, even, the dar even then the darkness isn't too dark for you. Nighttime would shine as bright as day, because darkness is the same as light to you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let's bow together for a moment of prayer. Our gracious and loving God, 
Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable to you. O Lord, our strength and our everlasting redeemer. Amen. There is a game among toddlers that is almost universal. It's a game that I've seen played dozens, maybe even hundreds of times by children of all races and all nationalities. It's a game that my own children and grandchildren have played, and although most of you were probably too young to remember it at the time, it's a game that when you were a toddler, you probably played as well. Interestingly enough, it's not a game that the toddlers can play by themselves. They actually need another older individual to help them play it. And usually that other individual is a parent or uh, an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent. But usually if grandparents are involved, the game can go on almost endlessly. It's a game that can be played almost anywhere, at your home, at our Wednesday night suppers here at the church, at a friend's house, when you're out at a restaurant, almost any place. And it is a game that can reduce the most sophisticated high-level executive to a virtual state of silliness. Have you figured out yet what game I'm referring to? Well, although it may be called by different names, the name it's called around our house is Peepie. How many of you have ever heard of that before? How many of you use the name Peekaboo? Yeah, that, that got a better response. Well, you remember how to play the game? You remember uh, what you do as a parent or grandparent will, will take the, the child's hands and they will put them over the toddler's eyes so that the toddler can't see. And then they'll begin to ask that question, where's mama, where's daddy, or in Carol's in my case, where's nana, where's granddaddy? And if you happen to be particularly insensitive, or lack the capacity to fully understand how frightening the dark can be to a child, you'll just throw a blanket over the child's face. <laughs> but then you'll wait for a couple of seconds, and, and, and then all of a sudden you'll announce those words, in our case, peep eye. And then you'll pull the child's hands away from his or her eyes, and then you'll deliver the punchline. There they are. And as long as the child is enjoying the game, he or she will giggle or something like that, and you'll just repeat the game over and over and over. Of course, if you happen to throw a blanket on the child's face, the, the child will probably cry, and the game will end very early. <laughs> Anybody want to know how I know about that? <laughs> now, there's a teaching principle that underlies this whole game, and, and that is this, that even though the child may assume that when they can't see the parent or the grandparent and that they're not really there, well, actually, they really are present. And as the child grows older, the child learns to trust that fact. Well, even though this is a, a game that is intended for toddlers, the Bible knows that there is a spiritual version of this game, and not dissimilar to the toddler version of the game. The spiritual version can be played almost any place, and at one time or another, it has been played by almost all of us. But in the spiritual version of the game, the assumption is that if God can be sensed, if God can be felt, then God is present. But if God can't be felt, if God can't be sensed, then apparently God is not present. Let me try to explain what I mean. Sometimes God's presence can seem so real, can it? In my experience, there are times when I just know that I know that God is present. Sometimes it happens in a worship service like this one. Sometimes the choir will sing or, or, or someone will be leading in prayer or maybe during the children's moments or, or, or I'll be sitting with you out in the congregation as one of our pastors is preaching and, and I'll just know that I'll know that God is here this morning. It, it sort of started when Lauren was singing that song that 
that, that Sonny wrote about the fact that the darkness cannot hide God, and it continued with this beautiful anthem. And I, I just knew that I was in the presence of God. Sometimes, sometimes it happens at the beach. Sometimes I will be standing on the shore of the beach at, during a sunset and I'll be looking out across the vastness of the ocean and, and the sky will be lit up with a, a bright brilliance that is so beautiful that it is almost beyond comprehension. And I'll just know that I know that I'm in the presence of God. Now, I'm told that you can have the same experience at sunrise, but I've never felt the urge to get up and find out about that. <laughs> Sometimes it happens when my grandchildren come to visit me. And they will come running up to me, and as they do, I'll just pick them up, and I'll lift them up in, into the air, and, and they'll throw their arms around my neck so tight it feels like a vice grip. And, and then they will say, I love you, granddaddy. And in that moment, it is not just their love that I feel. I am aware of the presence of a God who makes all of this possible. Sometimes it can just feel so real, can it? John Ortberg tells of a friend of his whose five-year-old daughter one time said, I know that Jesus lives in my heart. Because sometimes when I put my hand on my chest, I can feel him walking around inside. <laughs> and sometimes God's presence is like that, isn't it? We can just feel him walking around in our lives. But not every moment is like that, is it? Sometimes... After we leave a worship service of high inspiration, we go home to a house that has to be cleaned, bills that have to be paid, children who are sick, and, and in some cases, relationships that are very fragile. Or sometimes after we leave the beach, our cell phones start ringing and, and our inbox is full of emails that have to be answered and and we know that there are conflicts at work and it makes the office sort of pressure filled. Or sometimes, sometimes after our children or grandchildren have come and given us a hug and uttered those wonderful words, they will do something to annoy us or, or, or worry us. Now, not my grandchildren. I'm talking about your grandchildren <laughs> here. But sometimes these things happen to us and, and, and sometimes we get so focused on all of these things that it feels as if someone has put a blank, uh, uh, something in front of our eyes or thrown a blanket over our heart and we tend to forget. We for, tend to forget that wherever we are, God is. The Bible tells us that these moments are the moments when we particularly need to pay attention to the caution light. For these moments, when the pressure is on, when problems arise, and we tend to forget that God is with us, are the moments when we're more tempted to say or do something that is spiritually or relationally harmful, these are the moments when we are more tempted to cross moral and ethical boundaries. Why did the children of Israel build a golden calf in the wilderness when Moses was delayed from coming down from Mount Sinai? Because they forgot that wherever they were, God is. Why did Jonah run away from God after God had called Jonah to, to go and preach in Nineveh? Because he forgot that God's presence is inescapable. And why did Peter deny Jesus at the very moment when Jesus most needed his support? Among other things, it was because he forgot that even when God seems most distant, 
God is still with us. These are also the moments when we are more likely to adopt very destructive attitudes. I don't know how many of you have seen the recent movie that was released, uh, Christopher Robin. But there is this wonderful scene in the movie. Actually, there are a number of wonderful scenes in the movie. And, and if you're contemplating it, I'll tell you, it's more of an adult movie than it is a, a children's movie. But there is this wonderful scene. And before I get to that, just a little bit of background information. You remember Christopher Robin is the little boy who is able to crawl through a tree and magically enter the 100-acre wood forest. And there he meets uh, Winnie the Pooh and Piglet and Eeyore and some of the other animals of the 100-acre wood forest. And whenever there's a problem, whenever there's a problem, Christopher Robin is always the one who, who helps them solve the crisis. And so they come to depend upon Christopher Robin. But in the movie, we meet a grown-up Christopher Robin. And it is he who is in the midst of a crisis. And so some of the animals of the 100-acre wood forest, they decide to go and help Christopher Robin. And so they crawl through the tree and magically they enter the real world. And, and they're on their way to try and find Christopher Robin. And, and, and it's a mission it's kind of a mission impossible. It's fraught with danger and pressure and things like that. And anyway, they're on this train and, and, and they're looking out the window of the train. And Winnie the Pooh, presumably to try and help relieve some of the tension, asks them, what do you see? Thinking or assuming that they will say something like the grass, the trees, houses, cars, people, things like that. But instead what happens is Piglet, who's always very anxious, says, oh, I see panic, fear, worry. And Eeyore, the proverbial pessimistic donkey, says, I see humiliation, shame, and despair. And I remember that when I first saw that scene, I, I, I thought, you know, that's how a lot of us feel. When the pressure is on or when problems arise and we're not aware, that God is with us. Which brings us back to our lesson this morning. In the 139th Psalm, the psalmist asked that question, where can I go to get away from God's Spirit? Where can I go to escape His presence? And, and then the psalmist begins imagining all of these different places that he might go. He imagines ascending up to heaven. He imagines going down to the grave, or I like the way the King James Version has it, he imagines going down to hell. He imagines taking a ship and, and just sailing off to the farthest reaches of the world. He even imagines something equivalent to jumping into his bed and, and pulling the covers up over his head. But each time he imagines going to one of these places, he comes back to the central truth. Even there, God is with me. And what I think the psalmist learned and what I think he wants us to learn is that even in those moments when we can't sense God's presence, even in those moments when we can't feel God's presence, if we can remember the fact that he is still with us, then it can have a revolutionary impact on our lives. Even in those moments, then we are more likely to live lives worthy of the calling of Jesus Christ. Even in those moments, as we remember that he is with us, we can have peace when the pressure is on or have confidence when problems arise and live lives of sheer joy. A few years ago, my wife Carol and I had an opportunity to spend a few days in Italy. And one of the first places I wanted to visit when we got to Rome was the Colosseum, because I'd always heard that the Colosseum was the place where uh, Christians were persecuted for their faith in Christ and I just wanted to be there and, and, and be in that setting where these people had been so 
courageous. Turns out that that Colosseum probably never was used for that purpose, but they did say that it probably looked a lot like the Colosseums where that sort of thing would take place. So as we took our tour, we went different places. We went underneath the, the Colosseum and we went up top and, and we stood in different places. But there came this moment when we were standing in what was sort of like a, a, an aisle that went around the edge. And, and I wanted to just be alone for a, a, a few moments. So I stepped away from the other tourists and I went off by myself. And I just started trying to imagine what it must have been like for those early Christians. I, I looked over to a place and kind of imagined that that would have been the sort of place where Caesar sat when he gave the signal and the lions were released. And then I looked around at all of the seats that were in the Colosseum and imagined the crowd laughing and jeering as this terrible thing unfolded. And then my mind was drawn back to the very center of the arena. And I imagined the Christians huddled together in that place. And then I remembered. I remembered both the witness of the Bible and the testimony of the historians. That in moments like these, there was a, often a kind of unearthly joy that spread across the faces of the Christians. And they would begin to pray together and they would begin to sing hymns of praise. Now, how were they able to do that? I mean, in that moment, I suspect some of them didn't really feel God's presence. They were able to do it because they remembered that even in a moment like that, they were surrounded by the presence of God. No wonder, no wonder the Gospel of Matthew tells us that the very last thing that Jesus said to his disciples before he ascended to the Father, I mean, the very last thing was I am with you always, even to the close of the age. Jesus knew. Jesus knew that if his disciples could remember that, even when they didn't sense, even when they didn't feel, his presence. It could not only have a revolutionary, revolutionary impact on the way they lived their lives, but it could transform the way they face the future. And that, dear brothers and sisters, is the good news for this morning. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, This morning when we gather in this place around other men and women who share our faith with us, when we hear beautiful music being sung and the children up here and, and learning and when we're able to laugh some and celebrate some and when we listen to the music and sing the hymns, it's not hard to remember it's not hard to sense or feel your presence among us. But when we leave this place sometime later this week, we're likely to feel that the pressure is on or a problem is going to arise or a relationship is going to be strained or at the office there will be conflicts. In those moments, oh God, even if we can't feel it, help us to remember that wherever we are, you are with us. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. It's, you should have a song sheet there in your bulletins. We'll stand and sing. And as we sing this hymn, if there's anyone here who would like to come forward by a profession of your faith or a transfer of your membership, I invite you to come as we sing our closing hymn. Will you stand?
thank you for your presence this morning. When you go from this place, go in the knowledge that Christ is with you. And he is all around you. And he is under you. He is above you. He is out ahead of you. He is behind you. You are surrounded by his presence. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be in you and with you and fill you today, tomorrow, and for the rest of your life. Amen. Thank you.